Second Chronicles 34 Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem one in thirty years. So we're on to a new king. We've been going up and down, up and down, as we've talked about with Judah. There are right kings and there are evil kings. Here is one that is eight years old. He's on the throne. And his father, Manasseh, was 12 years old when he was on the throne. Uh, boy kings. And you know that the fact is, I mean, he ain't reigning all by himself. He's got counselors under him. But he's the king. He's in the line of Jesus Christ. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. But well, Manasseh didn't do what was right in sight of the Lord. The Lord had to put the rod upon him. Now, Manasseh got right, repented, got right with the Lord. Here is now a, a king who's doing right. Probably eight years old, maybe he did not see what his father had done. Maybe he only saw the repentant part of his father. But like we talked about yesterday, you can't guarantee if you live right, your child is going to live right. You can't guarantee if you live wrong, if your child is going to live wrong. There's no guarantee. And walked in the ways of David, his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. Now, walking in the ways of David, we've seen that over and over. And it's got to be the fact is that the history, what David did in the law of Moses, has to be brought into be because how else would they know David acted? So what you can probably assume out of this is Josiah knows Jewish history. He has been taught history. And why is America failing? And one of the things that is going wrong is the fact is of history in America, they don't know what history is. And number two is they change history. History is important. One of our ordinances that we are to take part in as a church is the Lord's Supper to remind us of what the sacrifice of Jesus Christ was all about. Because we forget. We go about our daily lives. The Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us is to bring in remembrance of that of the scriptures in the Lord Jesus Christ. So here it's being remembered of what David. David's going to be resurrected. You want a Sunday school lesson? You want a vacation Bible lesson? Why don't you talk about the resurrection of David? David is going to sit on the throne in the millennium right next to the Lord Jesus Christ as prince. That's a Bible study I never heard. Haven't heard that one. For the eighth year of his reign, while he, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David his father. So he's seeking, he's looking, he wants. And when somebody seeks after God for the truth, God is obligated to show him the truth, to give him the light. Now where God stops giving light is where you don't want any more truth. God will go as far as light, as far as you want. The time that you rebel and the time that you reject, that's it. No more revelation until you repent or get right and seek more. In the twelfth year he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. And we read in the final part of the last chapter last night that they were bringing this stuff back. They were had the groves. They were worshiping God in their own little way in chapter 33 verse 17. As your typical Baptists do today, we worship God, but in our own way. Josiah comes along, cleans up the whole thing. Jesus Christ, when he comes, is going to clean up the whole mess. And in order to find out if it's right, when the millennium, you can go over to Jerusalem and you can see Jesus Christ on the throne or you can see the 12 apostles around him, or even us, the Christian saints, that suffer him, that are allowed, uh, 
the given the uh, inheritance of reigning in cities that are faithful, you're allowed to come to one of us, the apostles, or Jesus Christ himself, and say, is this approved? Today we live by faith. And it's a dying faith of what is allowed and what's given in in the churches. And they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence. Now it's not in the presence of Balaam. The king is watching it and he's making sure the job gets done fully. Remember what happened to Manasseh? Remember he put all his idols away and they came back to haunt him? Joash must have saw that. So Joash is saying, listen, I'm watching you. I'm making sure that you destroy those images so they don't come back. That's what I preached about last night. you got to destroy your sins. Don't keep them in a the closet. Eventually that door is going to open up. And the images that were on high above them. So the altars, if there's images around the altar. You ever been in a church where they got images around the altar? I have. And he cut down and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. He break in pieces. He did it. And made dust of them. He made sure he polarized them. So you couldn't keep any part of it. And strolled it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto him. He burnt the bones of the priests upon their altars. And cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. He took the false priests. He burns them and then scatters their ashes on the altars. But to pollute the altars, that's what he's doing. Now in America today, what Joash is doing would be sacrilegious. Oh, you can't do nothing like that. You want to see how God reacts to this? You can't go in somebody's church and destroy their church and all that. Yeah, you got the Constitution. Why are you allowing them to preach? Why are you allowing them to, to say with the nonsense about God and all that? But when it comes to me, you're trying to shut me up. Why are my own people that are on my own military shooting bullets in my back while I'm going forward? So did he in the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim and Simeon, even to Naphtali. He's going into Israel. He's not just cleaning Judah. He ain't just cleaning his church house. He's going out and around about the land. If you truly want a revival in America, call 911. Call right now. You need to get rid of the Constitution. You need to get rid of these false religions. And you need to bring Jesus Christ back. By the way, do you know that the revivals that were set in America were all before we had a president? The great revivals that came to this country, there was no president. You said we don't want no king. And God says the only way that there's a leader of a nation if there's a king. God represents kings. But America doesn't want a king. She wants a president. And the presidents you find in the Bible, Daniel was one of them. And the rest of the presidents wanted to crucify Daniel. And when he had broken down the altars in the groves and had beaten the graven images into powder, into powder, and cut down all the idols throughout the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. So he stepped out. He stepped out of his comfort zone. He cleaned the land. Not only did he clean his domain, he went into Israel and started cleaning them. Israel is already gone into captivity by now. Now in the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land, the house, he sent Shiphan, the son of Azariah, 
and Masiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Johaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. Oh, look at that. The temple has been in dismay again. No one's been taking care of God's property. This place is always going down. This place is always falling apart. And no one's always taking care of it. The church today is out of disrepair. And I ain't talking about the buildings. I'm talking about the people. You're not building up. You're tearing down. And when they came to Hilkiah, the high priest, they delivered the money that was brought into the house of God, which the Levites had kept the doors, had gathered of the hand of Manasseh and Ephraim, and of all the remnant of Israel, that's the northern tribes, and of all Judah and Benjamin. And they returned to Jerusalem. So now they're getting Israel back. They're, they're, they're getting some kind of thing where they're getting Israel back and doing right, and Israel's offering money for the temple. That means some of the Israelites are coming down and they're worshiping like they're supposed to. And they put it to the hand of the workmen that had the oversight of the house of the Lord. And they gave it to the workmen that wrought in the house of the Lord to repair and amend the house. Even to the artificers and the builders gave they it to buy huge stone. That's amazing. The stones were decaying. And the timber for couplings, rotting. And the floors of the houses which the kings of Judah had destroyed. Oh, the kings of, this, of Judah have done the destruction. The men did work faithfully. And the overseers of them were Jaha and Obadiah, the Levites. The sons of Merari and Zechariah and Mishalem, of the sons of the Korhites, the set it forward, and other the Levites, all that could all that could skill instruments of music. Well, look at that. While they're working, they're playing music. Have you ever gone to you know have your car get worked on and they drive it in your garage and you can hear that filthy rock music playing in the background? Where did you think that came from? You ever been to a construction site and there's a radio playing? Have you ever been to a restaurant and the music playing? Have you ever been to a grocery store shopping along and next you know you're singing to that worldly music? You say, where did that come from? It come out of Second uh, Chronicles 34, King James 1611 Bible. They were playing music while they were working. Nothing new under the sun. See what happens when you get in your Bible and what nuggets you can learn and what you can see that what the world does, actually the world copies the Bible. And you thought going to the grocery store and hearing the music was something new, something that they thought of. No. It's something in the Bible. Also, they were over the bearers of burden. That's carrying wood, carrying bricks, carrying water, carrying food, the burdens. And we're overseers of all that wrought the work in any manner of service. And of the Levites, there were scribes and officers and porters. And when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah, the priest, found the book of the law, found the book of the, found the, found a book of the law of the Lord, Given by Moses. The one who put it there. You ever wonder those things? And Hilkiah answered, said to Shiph and the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah delivered the book to Shaphan. And Shaphan carried the book to the king. And brought the king word back again, saying, All that was committed to thy servants, they do it. Faithfully. They're doing the work they're supposed to do. You know, Christians today are not doing the work they're supposed to be doing. They're not out witnessing. They're not telling people about Jesus Christ. They're not reading their Bible. They're not praying. And they had gathered together the money that was found in the house of the Lord and had delivered it into the hand of the overseers in the hand of the workmen. 
Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest have given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the law that he rent his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah and Ahedekim, the son of Shephan, and Abandon, the son of Micah, and Shephan, the scribe, and Assassin, Asasa, Asiah, a servant of the king, saying, Go inquire the Lord for me, for them that, for them that are left in Israel, the Israel is going to captivity, and in Judah, concerning the words of the book that is found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us. Because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in the book. Josiah gets burdened. He gets under conviction. He's got a heavy heart now. He's fearing God. He's fearing the wrath of God. And Hilkiah and they that the king had appointed went to Hudulah. The prophet Tess goes to a woman, the wife of Shilam, the son of Tikva, the son of Harasha, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in a college, and they spank to her to that effect. Also, a college in the Bible is where you find a woman prophetess. And you know what Paul says about women preachers in Timothy, don't you? Uh, I ain't going to touch that to me. I'd like to, but I'm not. But do you remember another time where a woman was called by God to do a job because a man wouldn't? You find that in the book of Judges with Deborah. Beirut wouldn't go out and do what the Lord wanted them to do. We've studied that. You can go back and find the, the audio of the, of this, the messages that we've done. You got to a point here in uh, Josiah's life. You ain't got no men for the Lord. The men don't go to church no more. When called upon, the men don't read the Bible in the church. The women stand up and read. And the women do everything that the man is supposed to do. Well, Chronicles is not too far from our church age, isn't it? Isn't it great to study history? Isn't it great to find out that we're no further than we're further than we are in the Old Testament? That we're in the same place we are in the Chronicles. There are no men to stand up. The men are lacking. And she said, and she answered them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Tell ye the man, the king, that sent you to me. I wonder why she said the man and not the king. You got to read every word of the Bible. The king sent him. But she says the man. Do I have an answer? No, I don't. Sorry, I don't. Just point it out there. She doesn't say king. She says the man. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place. God is speaking through this woman. Because God can't find a man to stand up. Here's my question. Why didn't the king call one of the priests? Weren't you supposed to go to the Urim and the Thurim? Wasn't the priest supposed to know the law of Moses? You see how bad the nation got? You couldn't even call on the men that were called of God to do what they were supposed to do. You had to go to a woman. You know, America today and throughout the world now it's starting to spread. You got people in the pulpit and the men in the pulpit that can't do the job that God designed the pulpit for. They are not doing what, what, what the real office of a bishop is supposed to be. There's other motives. And most of those men that are in the pulpits today, they are not sent by God, but they are sent by Satan himself. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 
Listen, just because you think a guy gets up in the Pope and says, Thus saith the Lord, do you think that guy is sent by God? You're a fool. You have not studied the scriptures. How many times if you go back through Genesis to Second Chronicles where we are tonight and see that there were false messages, there's even one time that God sent a lying spirit to Ahaz because he wouldn't listen to what God told him to do. Even all the curses that are written in the book which they have read before the king of, Israel, king of Judah. Now you go back, I believe it's Deuteronomy. I believe it's a big long chapter that says, Cursed be the store, cursed be the people, cursed. There's a, there's a long curse. Like I said, we're going through the scriptures. I want you to study the scriptures. I want you to find it yourself. I don't want you to rely on me. Because I can be a liar. I want you to go find it yourself. There is a place in the Old Testament in the law of Moses where God curses them. And he says that, listen, if you don't do this, uh, something about seven times more. And he goes through a list and he said they don't do even more, seven times more. I believe that's where they're reading from. And God is right. They're being cursed for not doing what God told them to do. Because they have forsaken me, God speaking, and have burnt incense unto other gods. Do you know a church that burns incense and claims to be in the name of God? And they might provoke me to anger with the works of their hands. When you worship, when you offer incense to gods, you are angering God. Now, what is incense in the Bible? Incense is prayer. So when you offer your prayer to somebody else, that's not God. You are anger God. You say, well, how can I do that? Oh, let me please hit the right lottery numbers. Oh, if I can only get this, I can only get that. If my boss will only give me a raise, my boss will only promote me. Anything but God. And put the ATM card in and punch in those four magic numbers. And get money out, or go to a bank or to a loaning, and, and you know, just sign your your magical name on loan papers without seeking God. That's praying. That's that's seeking somebody else who's not God. Prayer is communication. Lord, I need something. And when you go to a bank guy instead of God, that angers God, because God has all riches. Therefore my wrath shall be poured out upon this place and shall not be quenched. Wow. You know somewhere else in the Bible something's not quenched? You people who are scholars and the like, you might want to turn off your ears for a minute because I'm going to say a four-letter word that you don't like. Turn off your ears for about five seconds. Ready? Those who got your ears open, hell is unquenchable fire. And as for the king of Judah who sent you to inquire the, of the Lord, so shall ye say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which thou hast heard, because thy heart was tender, and thou didst humble, the, humble thyself before God, when thou heardest his words against this place, and against the inhabitants thereof, and humbled thyself before me, he repented, he got right, and didst rent thy clothes, and weep before me. Oh, we didn't read about the weeping, did we? We read about the renting of the clothes. Don't you like when God tells you the whole story out of his own mouth? When he spoke to Satan about Job? I have even heard thee also, saith the Lord. Now, there's sometimes in your life you're going to say, Lord... If you read Psalms closely, Lord, are you listening? Lord, did you hear my prayer? Lord, do you know what I'm going through? And God sent a message to Josiah and said, You know what? I know thou humblest me. I know your heart. I've seen your tears. I've seen that you rent your clothes. And I'm answering you. I heard you.
Behold, I will gather thee to thy fathers. In other words, he's going to die a death where he's going to be buried with his fathers. And thou shalt be gathered to thy grave in peace. Neither shall thy eyes see all the evil that I will bring upon this place, upon the inhabitants the same. So they brought the king word again. So God told jo Josiah, it's not going to happen during your time, but you know it's going to happen. We're coming upon the last three chapters of this, this, this book, where, is, where Judah is going to go in captivity. But it's, it's been prolonged. It hasn't been canceled. The date's coming. So if you get right and do right, you might hold off judgment and wrath. If the church really wants to see a revival, the church needs to get right and do right and needs to start throwing garbage away. Then the king sent and gathered together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the priests and the Levites. Remember, all priests are Levites, but not all Levites are priests. And all the people, great and small. That means the, the hierarchies all the way down to the guy who's living underneath a bridge. The peasant, the fatherless, the widow. Only ones that could not come in would be the lepers. And he read in their ears the words of the book of the covenant that was found in the house of the Lord. Now he had the book of the law of Moses. There was no other versions of Moses' book. And when you get in the church age today, you got all kinds of versions of God's word. You got a mess. You got to have one book. The King James 1611 authorized version. Yes, you can call me King James only if you want. So does God. Thank you. You use the book, the Bible that Satan wrote. You be happy, but that's not what God that's not God's book. The king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart, with all his soul, to perform the words of the covenant which are written in the book. When's the last time you ever heard a Christian stand up and make a covenant that he's going to serve God and do do what God wants for his entire life? You know why a Christian won't do that? Because he knows God will do what is right and people want to do what is wrong. It says in John 3, 3, not verse 16, but John 3, it says that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are either, either, either evil or wicked. I forget which one. Even a born-again Christian, most today don't want to do right. I had one today. Try to help the person out. They want to go about their own way. Go ahead. Your life is already messed up. Your life is already in turmoil. It's only going to get worse. I'm doing what's right. And he calls all that were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to stand to it. So he made the people do it. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. You know what the law said? If you didn't, if you didn't want to serve God and do right, you were to stone them. Josiah is standing up to the law. He wants to God to be approved, and he wants to have God's favor. And Josiah took away all the abominations out of the countries that pertain to the children of Israel. They already got the junk out. He's getting the other junk out. He's not keeping nothing behind. You know why he's doing this? Because when we read the last few kings that are left, there is no excuse because Josiah 
gets rid of everything. He pulverizes it to powder. He throws it into the river to get rid of it. The only way you could bring that junk back into Jerusalem is you went looking for it. Now his grandfather Manasseh made a mistake. He put the stuff in storage. His father brought it out. Or the people brought it out. And it became a sin. Josiah pulverizes the stuff. There is no way you're going to reuse that stuff. It's washed down the river. So when it comes back, it's because that's what the people wanted. When this country had this great revival come through here, God cleaned up this country with, with the booze. He cleaned up the country with the sin. We had preachers come in here. People were getting saved left and right. They were dedicating their lives. And there was a revival in America, and the church said, we don't want that no more. We want the world. I like to teach the world to. No. The world is saying, I like to teach the church to conform along with me. Join in and be happily. Not in the eyes of God. It makes God sick. Revelation chapter 3. I'm sorry. A born-again Christian has no right to go to Disneyland. That's wasting your money. You're preaching again? Yes. You're wasting your money because half the time you're standing in line. You're going to go see a six-foot rat. Listen, if I saw a six-foot rat, I'm going down to the gun store. I'm buying me a gun that will kill that rat. And then the stupid rat talks. And he's got a dog named Dumbo. No, the Dumbo is everyone that holds a ticket or has a bracelet to this stupid place. Oh, you're just a killjoy. We'll see you at the judgment seat of Christ. I have all kinds of clean fun. And Josiah took away the abominations out of the countries that pertained to the children of Israel and made all that were present in Israel to serve even to serve the Lord their God. No one else. And all his days they departed not from following the Lord, the God of their fathers. Well, I'm going to give you a little preview. Guess what's going to happen in the next chapter? The Passover is going to be kept again. You just read where this guy went in there, destroyed other churches, destroyed other religions. Pulverize them. He took their priests and he burned them and he put them upon their altars. And you say, oh, how cruel, how wicked to do. But what did God do? Did you read what God said to him? He said, I'm not going to have this happen during your time. You're going to have peace. You're going to have rest. That's what the King James Bible says, black and white letters upon your page. Are we to go destroy someone's church? No. The government is job. Romans 13. You are not to allow that stuff to happen in this country, in your country, if you want to call yourself a Christian nation. Imagine calling yourself a Christian nation where you, where you allow the numbskulls to come walking around. Where the Bible says in the Old Testament, when they come to your house and they try to pervert you to another God, you're to stone them. It is to be a penalty of law. But our Constitution says it's allowable. And then you wonder why this country's a mess. Christians have all rights to live by the Constitution. We have rights to go tell people about Jesus. We have rights to stand on the street corner and yell, repent, turn or burn. We have all rights to go to our neighbor's house. We have rights that we can go to our employer and tell people about Jesus. We can whistle hymns and all that. But yet with the rights that we have by the Constitution, the Christians do not. Do what they're supposed to be doing. Yet, but under persecution, even in the book of Acts, during persecution, the word of God grew. That's where I'm going to end it right now. We've got the peace, we got the freedom, but you don't do the job you're supposed to do. Plain and simple. Close with that.